Jake, you gonna check the feed? Make sure the chat is up. Yep, give me one second. Where's where's our flag? Yeah, we're all good, guys. Thank you. We'll let everybody in. Sure. Uh, we'll... You don't have anything yeah. to say about any of your PTA at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> no, <we're> not really. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah. I don't know what it is about California. Should be good. You need one of the <laughs> I know. I know it's him. Um, I, 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 I know. Maybe that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ask, maybe you should focus on getting the teachers back. All right. Good idea. Mr. Cross, are we all good? We are good to go. Everybody ready? Yep. Flags behind us. Yep. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Portsmouth School Committee meeting of Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021. Will you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence for our troops in harm's way and the flag straight behind me here. You can see it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, prior uh, to, prior to our uh, opening up of the public session, we had an executive session. Uh, no votes were taken. Can I have a motion please to seal the executive session minutes? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Let me call the vote, which we have to do because we are on Zoom. Ms. McDade? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Piero? Aye. Emily Copeland? Aye. Unanimous 7 0. Uh, chairperson's remarks, please let the roll call reflect that everybody is uh, present and accounted for at tonight's meeting. It's a pleasure to be back in a hybrid format as opposed to all on Zoom. So, um, if we do have an emergency here at the high school, we know to evacuate out the doors and meet over by the uh, new gym. Uh, for my chair's report tonight, just like to report that uh, Assistant Superintendent Viveros and I uh, had the pleasure of attending um, the Melville uh, parent uh, teacher group. Um, and uh, Ms. Viveros gave some opening remarks and I gave a few, but it was a uh, really a, a very nice um, meeting to see uh, all the Melville and the parents again. And I do want to announce as a community service announcement for Melville uh, that they will be having a fundraiser for MPTG at Plumbies um, on February 24th, which is tomorrow night. Um, so uh, if you have a chance to want to call out for dinner, you could go to Plumbies and they will be donating 10% of all cells to uh, Melville schools. We know it's been challenging for our parent teacher groups to do fundraising in the pandemic, but this is a way to help local restaurants and our parent teacher groups at the same time. Um, I see Ms. Lori on there. So if there's anything she wants to add, she can too. But um, the second thing is we also had some school committee members attend the community meeting. Uh, Ms. Kelly was at the community meeting. I think Mr. Vadney, Mr. Payer, were you there too? For? The Melville community meeting? Yes. So we had uh, um, three school committee members joining Melville for that community meeting and really enjoyed um, seeing what all the kids were writing in the chats, I think. <laughs> 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 um, I'd like to invite Mr. Payero to uh, uh, talk for a minute, minute about the LEAP task force to which he has been appointed by uh, the Commissioner of Education, um, Infante Green, we announced this at the last meeting, but uh, Mr. Payero, please. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so, yes, I was appointed to the LEAP Task Force, which uh, stands for Learning Equity and Accelerated Pathways, and with the goal of 
uh, assessing the impact of COVID-19 on the schools and communities across the state, analyze Rhode Island specific academic and non-academic data, and identify a, a focus and, ident and engage with national experts on those areas, identify research-based high leverage strategies to address identified root causes and establish a strategic focus for the state and provide field guidance and align stimulus funding to instructional priorities driven by the data. It is a six uh, week program that's very intense and moving very fast and actually headed by our former superintendent and, and O'Reilly at the state level. So it's great to uh, always see an old face. Um, um, where today was, we actually reached our, our halfway mark. We do have three more sessions uh, that are going to be talking about serving the needs of diverse populations, thinking through a whole, a whole of system response in the equity lens, and then by mid-March providing recommend a draft recommendations uh, that will be sent to the commissioner for review. <laughs> Great, great. Oh, thank you. I, th I think it's it's a nice honor that you were appointed to that. We have some East Bay representation on there. So welcome. thank you. Um, and then this is for the school committee members. Uh, the National School Board Association um, has an annual conference this year. It's going to be virtual. Um, so they've obviously, it wouldn't involve any travel. Um, we could do a, a, a school board fee, you know, like group registration, if there's interest. Um, it's April 8th, 9th, and 10th, if I remember correctly. Um, and I think uh, we would need to know fairly soon if there was interest to make it um, really, you know, worthwhile. Um, so uh, if you are interested in attending this, um, uh, there's a lot of panels and a lot of professional development uh, to choose from. We are required to do six hours of professional development a year. Um, be sure to uh, maybe send uh, the superintendent an email and you can copy me on that too. So if we see we have enough um, school committee members to make it um, worthwhile. How much is it? Um, I don't know. There's a reduced rate if it's a all just, district. It's just the conference registration fee because everything is virtual. Yeah, so the there's no travel, there's no lodging, no well, food. Can't be I, think what Tom, I think what Tom yeah. may be asking is, is there... Is the fee reduced? Yeah. Or if you're not asking, no. That's the last point is, is the fee reduced, reduced yeah. from the normal fee because the normal yes. fee is like seven hundred. Yes, because it's all it's that. all virtual. Yeah. And I think it has also a, a group rate, like you can send X to so many. But again, we'll have to judge interest and then see whether it would have been. I'd be interested if it was reasonable. Okay, yeah. I second two. So again, we can maybe we could uh, get Amanda to look sure. into the particulars and send that out to everybody so they have a way to judge on that. All right, that's it for my uh, chairperson's remarks. Uh, subcommittee updates, uh, finance subcommittee met, Mr. Ferber? Yeah, the finance subcommittee met on the on the 12th of February, and basically that was our second look at the proposed uh, budget. And so we evaluated the um, revenues and expenses for the upcoming year, and shortly there'll be a report by uh, the finance director as to what our proposed budget is. So the one, the one big mystery right now on the expense side is transportation expenses, which could be significant. Right. Okay. And the fact, the fact that the state's shorting us $169,000. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, recognitions, Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you. Uh, so it's my pleasure tonight to recognize uh, several Portsmouth High School students who were Scholastic Art Award winners. I know we have a number of uh, students and their families on this evening, also the teachers of the various programs at the high school. So uh, these uh, awards are typically given in, in, in all the art areas, uh, photography uh, and media. And so there's a good intersection for us among two of our CTE programs as well in, in art and the uh, digital media area. Um, so is my pleasure tonight. We're gonna to just kind of read their names and uh, what they won uh, their award for. And then uh, to the families, we have certificates that will be going out as well. So uh, Anastasia Otten. Oh, they're doing it right now. Uh, won a gold key award in the area of digital art. Uh, Grace Backen won an honorable mention 
for her art portfolio. John Harding won an honorable mention uh, for painting. Abigail Kenyon won an honorable mention for photography and a silver key award in photography. Addison Page won a silver key award in mixed media. Paige Sullivan won a silver key award in digital art and a gold key in uh, Scalat, oh, sorry, in digital art. Uh, Amelia Tavares won an honorable mention for photography and a silver key award in photography. And Zoe Vaspel uh, won an honorable mention for film and animation. So congratulations to those students, their teachers and the students' families, of course. So, so um, there's a video that the uh, art and media department put together for this. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing that out in my updates at the end of this week for the entire community to see. I mean, I think we have a, so much to be proud of for the, the Portsmouth arts community. They always do so, so well with these uh, awards and really, really do the district proud. So congratulations. I know from all of us here for the students and the staff and the faculty, really, really great job. So round of applause. Too bad we don't have you here in person to do the photographs. <laughs> all right. Um, is there any public comment? You can either raise your hand or, um, and then we can have you unmuted if we need to. Um, I don't see any public comment to you, Mr. Costa. Not at all. Okay, uh, moving on uh, to our PHS liaisons communications. Emily. Sorry? I think someone. Oh, wait a minute. Do we have public comment? She's raising her physical hand. Yeah. Oh, we have somebody raising a physical that's, hand there. Uh, Ms. Escobar. Escobar. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, great. Thank you so much. I just wanted to quickly say that um, if you would look at the Scholastics Awards that are typically given throughout the country, Portsmouth has done a phenomenal job. Um, we're usually a role model for our entire state. And again, I just wanted to point out that we actually took 11 awards this year. And if you compare that across the communities, we're always tops. We always... Um, we're looked, our art department is actually a model for the state and so many districts come to us and ask us about our programs, you know, how are they so successful? And so I think, you know, kudos to Diane Kreese for really bringing us all on board with the CTE program. And I think you're gonna only see this um, opportunity for students, not just in our community, but beyond really grow. So I just wanted to say, and Gary with the filming program and then all the art teachers, dedicated staff, these students have come through the ranks from right up, you know, elementary to high school. And we're really super proud. I hope you guys get a chance to look at the video. Not only are there portraits on there with their names and the years they graduate, but their artwork is in that video. So thanks Tom for uh, pointing out that they, well, everybody will have the chance to see their work. And I'm so proud of you guys. You rocked it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well said, well said. So that video is coming out this Friday? Yep, right. I have it. This is as far as given it to me, so it'll be ready to go this Friday. And we also, I also saw in the paper the other day, they had the, um, the advertisement for the PHS CTE uh, virtual open house, which is um, this, this Friday too. Yep. So you're a good First ambassador day. for the CTE programs. <laughs> it'll be in my updates later on. Cool. Um, all right, uh, sorry, any other comments, questions? No? Okay. Um, moving on to the PHS liaisons report, Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Uh, Pardo de Zeva. Okay. Um, so one of the major things we have going on at the high school right now is the student council is planning a spirit week for April um, because the year is shared and there's so many things we can't do. We're trying to find an alternative to them to try and keep the freshmen, they get to see all the types of things we do during Spirit Week and the seniors, they still get their Spirit Week. Um, 
so right now we're currently trying to come up with alternatives and ways that we can safely carry out Spirit Week as normally as possible. So Student Council is also in line with Spirit Week. We're hosting our Spirit of Portsmouth, which in the past, or sorry, Best of Portsmouth, which in the past has been known as Spirit of Portsmouth or Mr. Portsmouth. In this pageant, we're trying to plan for an in-person event on the Friday of Spirit Week. However, we're also looking at alternative solutions for if it has to be completely online. So we are aware of that possibility, but we're really hoping to try to plan it out and space out the theater to be able to have it be a live event. However, we're also, for the month of March, we're also going to have another blood drive at St. John's because all of ours have been really successful. And each one we've had, we've had more participants. So we'll have more information on that in the next few weeks as we may meet with our representative from the Rhode Island Blood Center. But that's what Student Council is up to for the next two, next few weeks and what most of the student body will be focusing on. But if you guys don't have any questions, then we are all set. All right. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the school committee? Okay, seeing none, great report, guys. Thank you very much. We appreciate you uh, zooming in and keeping us uh, up to date with what's going on. Uh, moving on to the superintendent's update, Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you, Dr. Copeland. So I'm gonna start with a, a quick personnel update. We didn't have much in the area of uh, personnel since our last meeting to update on. However, I do have two resignations that I wanted to announce and recognize these individuals. So uh, the first, you may remember the name of Mr. Aaron Escher. Um, he, he had been a long time teacher with us. He was our first science coach several years ago when we started that position and eventually moved on to become an assistant principal at Portsmouth Middle School a couple of years ago. He left the district to take a position at the Rhode Island Department of Education as a science specialist. So uh, there is legislation when a teacher takes on uh, any administrative role or a role at the state level, they have a three year window where they could come back uh, to their teaching position. So Mr. Escher did start that when he originally took the position at Portsmouth Middle School. Essentially, he's just coming up on the end of that and gave us the courtesy of letting us know that unfortunately he will not be returning to us and is going to stay in his uh, current position at Ride. So I did just wanna take a moment and recognize him. He was a longtime district employee. Uh, the second resignation we received was uh, Mary Saladino who uh, we brought on a couple of years ago, Director of Student Services, that's an assistant principal position at Portsmouth High School. Um, Mary uh, did uh, request a year's leave of absence this year. Uh, so this is not uh, entirely out of the blue. She's just letting us know that uh, she will not be returning when that leave of absence expires. So we, would, we certainly wish her well. Okay. Then under district updates, um, so we were happy, of course, to welcome all students, staff, and families back from our winter break. We hope that everybody uh, took the opportunity to relax and unwind as much as possible. Uh, later this week, uh, in my updates, I will be publishing uh, just a, a, a final district calendar, if you will, for our COVID testing schedule. So you've, you've heard me reference for the past several months, we were um, you know, able to roll out um, you know, and, and had been going a little bit at a time with a testing schedule for uh, students and staff. Uh, so I can announce that um, based, we wanted to make sure that we hit all groups at each school and, and had a good feel for what we were going to be able to maintain. But based on what we know, we will be able to receive every week for the number of tests and the capacity that we have within the district to administer those tests. Uh, we will be able to continue to offer biweekly uh, voluntary testing for all students and staff for the remainder of the school year and mandatory testing. We will continue weekly for student athletes. Uh, so to date, I know I've gotten a few questions here and there on well, how many tests, what are the results? Uh, I've been a little hesitant because um, I don't, I don't want to jinx us, but I can, I can report tonight that we have administered in our, in our trial run so far, um, making sure that we, we, provided opportunities to every group. We've administered over 1,400 tests so far. We have not had one positive test in the district. Wow. And I can tell you that that is not, that, that is not typical when I talk to uh, my superintendent colleagues around the state. We're using the Binex uh, rapid test, which is considered to be 95% effective. If there is a positive test uh, on this test, the Rhode Island Department of Health counts it as a positive test. So that's the uh, reliability of this test. So. I would like to attribute our results to the fact that 
Uh, again, we have great cooperation among our families and staff in following our protocols. And of course, most importantly, since this is an asymptomatic test, I'm hoping what this is telling us is that when anyone has symptoms, they're well aware that they should not be coming to work. So again, um, hopefully uh, I didn't jinx us uh, on, on those results and that can continue. Uh, we of course wanna thank Mrs. Lynn Arvanis and our nursing staff for spearheading these efforts for us. And last meeting, I had announced that the town of Portsmouth was getting ready uh, to uh, open up a municipal vaccination site at the Raytheon facility. So last week, that, that site did open uh, for its first operations, uh, and uh, they uh, plan to continue to remain open uh, at that site, uh, you know, based on vaccine availability and the Rhode Island Department of Health protocols for who can receive the vaccine. Town and school department employees will have the opportunity, we're hoping that comes within the, the next few weeks, to also receive vaccines at this site in accordance with those parameters set by the Rhode Island Department of Health. So when I announced uh, that this would be happening at the last meeting, uh, I thanked our facilities director, Mr. Dean, our technology director, Mr. Costa, who in their shared roles with the town had, had been very instrumental in helping to get this up and running. Um, also, uh, our network manager, Mr. Jacob Karen and our system support technician, Mr. Ray Ballard, have also uh, been heavily involved in getting uh, everything up and running here. And just wanted to point out as well that, uh, again, hopefully more residents and town school employees are going to have the opportunity to visit this vaccination site. Uh, all of the devices that are being used at this site uh, have been loaned by the school department. So um, these were devices that the, the tech department is able to refurbish. Um, and so I think it's and just a great example of the collaborative efforts on the town and school part. Given both, uh, you know, testing, vaccines have, have, have both been uh, big areas that we've, we've wanted to make sure that we, we could get in place. Um, so with that, I know I do continue to get questions about the possibility of expanding uh, full in-person learning opportunities for students in grades seven through 12. So I just wanted to provide a quick update on that. Those are definitely two key pieces. Um, you know, the, the numbers within uh, our, our municipality and the state level are certainly uh, you know, pieces, key pieces of data there. Again, right now, those seem to be trending downward, which is good. Uh, uh, but of course, another big part of that is being able to assure that we have the proper spacing that we would need to have within our building. So, just to again, make sure everyone is aware of where we currently stand with, with our in-person learning. We have full in-person learning opportunities five days a week for grades PK through six and uh, seven through 12 is on a hybrid schedule. So at seventh and eighth grade currently, they either have two in-person or three in-person learning opportunities per week that alternates every other week for those grades and students in grades nine through 12 consistently have two in-person uh, learning opportunities. Both Portsmouth Middle School and Portsmouth High School have been working during the second quarter marking period, where our main objective and what both schools have been working on is to identify students who are struggling either academically or social emotionally and provide those students and their families more in-person learning opportunities. So both schools have examples of students who are attending school every day. I just wanted to make everyone aware of that. And with that, while I don't have information I can share uh, definitely this evening, Mrs. Viveros, our assistant superintendent, has been working with the administration and the school improvement teams of both schools to look for creative strategies within, again, that, that last key hurdle for us is going to be six foot spacing, but I know that both schools have ideas of how we can, at least for some, some groups or grades, increase those in-person learning opportunities. So we're hoping have more information to share on that in the coming weeks. Also, our racial and so, racial equity and social justice ad hoc subcommittee met just before break at this meeting. The subcommittee reviewed a draft mission and vision statement and created subgroups to align with the goals that we have established for the work of this committee. Uh, Mr. Piero and Mrs. Viveras, as I've updated, are, are leading this group. Uh, I attend every other meeting this is kind of the parameters that we had set for the work at the beginning of the year. So I'm looking forward to joining them at their next scheduled meeting. 
I also wanted to highlight uh, an idea and, and some work uh, Mrs. Rivera and Dr. Colwell, our uh, Director of People Personnel, put together regarding kindergarten registration. So this year, we identified a list from our early intervention registry, and that is uh, each town has to outreach to three and four-year-olds and, and, and do screenings and provide services if needed. So um, we were able to put a list together of our current four-year-olds who would be eligible for kindergarten this year. Mrs. Averos then worked with her registration team, uh, developed and sent a postcard to each of these families with uh, instructions on how to begin the pre-registration process. And I think we've been very pleased so far to see the, the, the rate of uh, you know, a feedback we've had people, people who started the process today is much higher than we would typically see at this, this time. So, um, you know, kudos to them for that idea and those efforts. Uh, Dr. Colvin mentioned earlier on Thursday evening of this week, uh, the Portsmouth High School CTE programs will be leading a virtual open house beginning at 7 p.m. Information will be provided. Uh, this is for both Portsmouth students or out of district families interested in attending one of our ride approved CTE programs in engineering, education, video production, or art. More information can be found on both our district and the Portsmouth High School websites. And I think again, we saw some great connections there with those classic art award winners earlier. I also just wanted to mention, we are wrapping up uh, season two of our athletic uh, schedule for middle and high school. So this year, uh, typically, we would see three seasons, right, that we're used to a fall, winter, and spring. <clears throat> the uh, Rhode Island Interscholastic League tried to create a schedule here that will have four abbreviated seasons in an attempt to fit in as many athletic opportunities as possible. So right now, we're in this transition from season two to season three. And I've asked Mr. Tresvan, our athletic director, to come to our next meeting on March 9th to provide kind of a wrap-up of season two and, you know, preview which sports are running at the middle and high school for season three. Finally, this week is National Public Schools Week as recognized by the leading education associations in our nation. Uh, a statement from one of those groups, the Association of American, of American Educators reads, the innovations, ingenuity, and commitment displayed throughout the nation's public schools during the most challenging of school years has been nothing less than heroic. Public school educators continue to put their students' needs first and remain the foundation of our nation's strong tradition of public education. And I thought that that quote definitely applied to everything that I have seen uh, take place this year with our educators here in the Portsmouth School District. So I do wanna thank them, recognize uh, everyone for their work and the efforts it has taken uh, you know, for us to provide the best possible education experience for our students this year. I am certainly proud to be the superintendent of this district. Thank you. Well, Teachers and staff and uh, administrators. I have a question. Is yes, there, Mr. Bad. Is there any news on potential football season? Yep, that will, football is going to be in season three. Okay. So those sports are just getting ready to start. Um, we'll get a full report from Mr. Tresvan at the next meeting. Okay. Yep. Football is, is running in season three. Have they been sure. doing any weight training? Yep, they had been as much as possible within you know the the restrictions and guidelines that we have. They've been they've been doing their, they're trying to do their usual group training. Good. All right. Well, the, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I have a motion, please, for the approval of school committee minutes of February 9th, 2021 and the February 9th, 2021 executive session? Second. Any comments, discussion? There were a couple of, of small errors, which were believe they were corrected fixed. Yep. beforehand. So I don't have any changes. I'm looking at Ms. McDade virtually. I don't see anything there. Okay. Um, so um, call the vote. Ms. McDade. Sorry. Aye. Aye. Uh, Ms. Kelly. Aye. Mr. Ferber. Aye. Mr. Shears. Aye. Mr. Vadney. Aye. Mr. Piero. I abstain because I wasn't here. Do I have to abstain? Oh, you're abstaining? Yeah, I, was, I wasn't present. Mm -hmm. And uh, Emily Copeland, I, six, I, one abstention. Uh, can I have a motion for the approval of the consent agenda, please? So moved. Second. Um, uh, Ms. McDade? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Uh, Emily Copeland? Aye. Unanimous, seven, zero. 
Um, can I have a motion for discussion on the first draft of the FY22 operating budget? You really need a motion? Yeah, it's just as discuss. It's just as for discuss. All right, I'm, I move for discussion of the first draft of the fiscal year 22 Can operating chair. Second. Okay, uh, turn this over to you, Superintendent Ken. You don't have it? Uh, okay. Um, uh, for, okay. Uh, Mrs. Rivera, you, you're still a co host, right? Can you share the? I don't have my computer with me. Oh. Or someone who has. I am not able to open that right. Uh, hold on. Uh, business. Uh, business A, first draft, right? Correct. All right, and um, I can share it if you'd like. I think, I I think uh, we almost got it here, Chris. Okay. okay. It should be sharing. Okay. I, you'll have to move the faces though, because I can't do that. All right. So you'll, who's gonna, you'll be able to move it? Mm -hmm. All right, we can go to the first slide. All right, so this evening we are sharing, again, this is on as a discuss only item because it is the first draft of uh, our FY22 budget. Um, so I just wanted to start by uh, reviewing, um, you know, kind of where we are in, in our timeline. We've looked at this timeline a few times throughout the process. Um, so this evening we're going to be talking about the first draft of our operating budget. Uh, we're going to um, obviously take comments and your feedback tonight as a full committee. Um, and then we'll see a, another draft of this uh, at our next meeting, uh, go, go through the same process. And then a uh, final draft, which you do have to vote on for the March 23rd meeting. Uh, this evening as well, uh, after this presentation, uh, there is a presentation for a discussion and approval for uh, the technology five-year equipment uh, budget that is part of our overall budget. And Costa will be presenting that. And the only other uh, uh, thing for us to do besides approving our final budget by that March 23rd meeting is, is an approval of our capital, facilities capital budget. <laughs> okay, and then uh, as, as everyone is aware, by the end of March, we have an obligation per town charter to turn a final school committee approved budget over to town for town council review and then later in April um, there are meetings scheduled with the town council we present at that point as as do all of the other various town departments um, what you don't see here as I condensed in the timeline is that to get to to this point and where we are we've really been working since the fall um, and we've we uh, start this process by asking all of our the principals of our schools uh, the leaders of various departments, like Dr. Colwell with special education, Mrs. Averis with curriculum, and they work with uh, all of the uh, you know, teachers and, and, and other people in their areas um, and, and eventually submit a budget to us just prior, you know, their, their budget request just prior to uh, the winter holiday break. Then when we return from the holiday break in January, we have meetings set up, members of our finance committee typically attend those meetings we meet with with each school, each department, they review their budget, and we work towards putting together this draft that you will see here this evening. Uh, go to the next slide. So in a few minutes, I'm going to hand things over to our finance director, Mr. Sedero. He's going to walk you through the details of this budget. Uh, some of the points that I just wanted to make before we start getting into those details are laid out here on this slide. So you're going to see in what Mr. Dioro reviews that this budget uh, for uh, fiscal year 22 uh, has, you know, would have right now as currently stands an overall increase in expenditures of 2.5%. And again, for our first draft, which just represents kind of a roll up from uh, what the schools and various departments exist, uh, that is, is you know, not a particularly high figure. We've, in previous years, been higher than that uh, for our first draft. 
I wanted to point that out because I did want to, again, take the opportunity to thank uh, all the individuals who contributed time and effort to this budget development process. And knowing uh, you know, what we've heard so far or anticipating we're going to hear from the, the town side throughout this budget process, I did ask all of our uh, principals, all of our department leaders to come in with a, a, a overall level funded budget, if you will, so that while they had the ability to make changes within their budget, if they, if they felt that there was something they wanted to add, they would have to offset that with um, you know, other areas in their budget that they reduce. And same thing for personnel. Uh, there are no personnel increases in this, this current budget draft. Uh, there may have been areas where, where people thought that they had a need in, in, in a certain area, but you know, they were told that they had to reduce in other areas um, all, all right. So all of that work has been done within this draft. Okay, so again, this is a no staff increase. Uh, I believe everyone is aware we added additional positions this year due to COVID and things like cust additional custodians, nursing assistants, uh, none of those positions because they were grant funded with money we received. So none of those positions are in this current budget. And there, there are really no big asks um, you know, from any, any um, you know, school or department. This 2.5% increase in expenditures, um, again, in, in, in any $40 million budget, you would normally see in increases when it comes to personnel, healthcare. We have contracts with, uh, for things like transportation, facilities, um, our utilities contracts. Um, so those are the things that are really driving uh, any increases that you see here in this first draft. So I did want to make sure, again, before Mr. Dior gets into the details, uh, that we, we made that as clear as we could up front. However, although we, you're only going to see in this draft a 2.5% increase in expenditures, that would require right now, if this was the draft we were going to present, and it's not, as I, as I mentioned, we're going to do work over the next uh, few months uh, to get to a final version of this. But right now, this budget with just a 2.5% increase in expenditures would require a 3.9% increase in, in our town appropriation. And the reason for that is the town appropriation for every school department represents the largest revenue source. And our other areas of revenue, um, you know, what we can project based on the information that we have are down. And the main driver of that is in state aid, which uh, you know, the overall figures represent a 4.4% reduction in state aid. Uh, we were not anticipating that. We came up, uh, should be coming up on the end of a 10 year transition in the state funding formula, which we you know, knew were well aware of uh, that Portsmouth was losing money throughout that formula as it was, we were transitioning through it but we were expecting to at least remain flat uh, this year. However, when we received the projections, we found that in, in the calculations that they're using, we're still losing uh, when it comes to state aid. And the other area, our other main revenue sources, um, again, we don't, we don't have much as a school department. You know, our mission is to educate students. Uh, however, we do have um, you know, tuition agreements in this district with both Little Compton and uh, through our CTE programs, we're able to bring in students from outside the district. You know, both of those are revenue sources for us, but you know, Little Compton enrollment is going down every year, just like our own enrollment has been. And this year, uh, the number of CTE students, mainly due to COVID, was less than we were anticipating. So the projections for both of those are, you know, are down in this budget as well. So again, this, you know, currently what you will see is a 3.9% increase uh, in the town appropriation is coming primarily because of the reductions of revenue in those other areas. So again, I will turn things over to Mr. Diero here in a, in a minute. Um, when he is done presenting, we will certainly look to your guidance uh, because, uh, you know, as far as the direction that you want us to take as we continue to work through the drafts of, of this budget, that you will see. I do just want to make the, the point, which I think everyone is aware of, that you know, at, at this point, uh, to reduce that town appropriation, we're going to need to either see some um, you know, 
additional information that will help us drive up those revenue projections in other areas or have to start looking at cutting expenditures. And I believe those are all the points that I wanted to make. So Mr. Dioro, uh, we can go to the next page and I will turn things over to you. All right, thank you. So uh, as the superintendent said, this first draft of our budget really sort of shows us that what we have is a revenue problem, not really a spending problem. Um, but if this first page here is sort of a summary of uh, all of our revenues, and while we're going up 2.5% to uh, mirror the increase in our expenditures of 2.5%, you can see where we're losing that $169,000 in state aid and also little Compton tuitions and CTE tuitions. So uh, the town appropriation is that 3.9% is sort of where that difference is being made up again in this first, first draft. So if you can go to the next page. So this is a summary of our expenditures. Um, I won't spend too much time on this because I want to spend more of the time going through the detail behind this. But um, one of the things I did want to point out is uh, you'll see the personnel services, which is compensation for our employees. Looks like it's going down uh, almost 1%. Um, and employee benefits are going up 3%. What, what this is really, um, this year in our budget, we've decided that we were going to utilize some of our grants in a, in a different way. And what we did is we did move employee uh, benefit and compensation costs and move them to uh, our federal grants. Um, and we took uh, out of district tuitions and we put those costs back on the general fund. And the reason why we did that uh, is because that will allow us to recoup uh, some of those tuition co <clears throat> costs uh, through Medicaid. And so if you look at the other purchased services line, which is the uh, 55000, that's going up 17.3%. That's sort of the offset where you're seeing the tuitions come back on uh, on the budget, um, offsetting what is a looks like a decrease in salaries. So if you can move on to the next page. Um, so these are the details that make up um, the summary page we just talked about. So if you look at the first line, 51110 regular salaries, Again, it looks like we're going down, but really we've moved 14 uh, RBT aids uh, off of our general fund budget. So comparing to last year, it looks like it's going down, uh, but we're really funding those through a grant. Under the benefits, uh, healthcare, uh, 52,121, uh, looks like it's going up 3.1%, which would not uh, be a terrible increase in healthcare. Uh, but really what we're seeing uh, there is the same thing. All of the benefits related to those RBT aids, including healthcare, are being funded now by the grant. So uh, if that was back on this budget, uh, apples to apples, uh, that number would be much higher. We're actually looking at an increase in our premiums between 8 to 12%. Uh, we're right now using 8% in our budget. And um, uh, we'll get better information from the trust uh, the further we go in this budgeting process, but right now we're using the 8% as our baseline. Uh, we're also looking at um, ERSRI certified staff pensions going up 4%. Uh, again, that's a combination of uh, the state providing us with uh, the percentage of salary we'll need to contribute next year that comes from the state, uh, compounded by um, increases in uh, step movements and that type of thing. Uh, the private pension payment is up 9.2%. Uh, that's 52,204 is the line. Uh, again, that's a number that comes from the actuaries and um, that's a known number, that's not an estimate. Um, our workers' compensation towards the bottom of the page, 52,710. Um, we uh, have had some uh, poor experience in workers' comp the last few years. And uh, in FY21, the year we're in now, uh, we actually um, were rated in a higher tier uh, than we had been before, which caused our workers' comp premiums to increase pretty substantially. Uh, so what I'm just doing here is, is reflecting what's actually already happened. I wanna move down to the next page. Okay, so on this page, um, the other professional, other purchased professional education services, 53,220. Um, that's going up 67,500. 
Uh, and what that is, is um, outside uh, consulting services to provide BCBA supervision of our RBTs, uh, which is required for them to um, um, continue to uh, have their RBT certificates. Uh, and then down under uh, contracted nursing services, 53417, uh, that's just an additional nurse for a student um, that uh, we know we'll need to provide next year in our budget. If you can move down to the next page. Uh, okay, so we have here is our um, purchased property services. Uh, staying fairly level, um, we've added some money to our HVAC line, 54322. Uh, and that's mainly to continue to purchase those MERV 13 filters, which are the filters that um, are the ones that catch the COVID virus. Um, we did not have those in the past. We had MERV uh, 8, which is pretty standard. Um, the MERV 13s are much more expensive, so we're putting that in the budget. Uh, moving down under transportation, 55111, um, our contract uh, has expired or is expiring. We're in a one-year rollover. Um, we were assuming uh, about an 8% increase in that line. Uh, we did open up our, um, we went out to bid and we opened up our proposals today. That looks like we'll, we'll do a lot better than that. Looks like we'll be closer to about 3.5%. We have to go through that. We just got it today, but it uh, looks like we may have in our second draft that we proposed present, uh, have some savings on that line. Uh, then you can see 55630, uh, tuition to private sources. That's where I was uh, earlier explaining, we're bringing on tuitions onto this budget that were funded in the past through federal grants, uh, but really it's just a one-for-one -one swap with um, salary and benefits. Uh, moving down a little bit further, natural gas 56201. Um, our supply contract, uh, which had been a three-year contract, did expire. Um, this winter, uh, we did uh, go out and renew that contract. We do that uh, collectively with the town together. Um, and um, we saw a very substantial increase, over 15% in the supply cost, uh, not necessarily distribution. It's about a 50-50, um, the cost of supply versus distribution. But we did see our, our uh, supply costs go up. So that's being reflected in that line right there. Go on to the next page, please. Um, and I think that's uh, probably about what I wanted to hit on for highlights, but I'm happy to ask, uh, to answer any questions that you, you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, looking to the committee, um, I see Ms. McDade, do you have any questions? I'm wanting to try. Not at this time, thanks. Okay, Mr. Shears. Yeah, on the uh, revenue, uh, when we're saying that uh, that would be like the 3.9 town appropriations, are we on the revenue for the calculations for the town on their taxing and growth, are we using numbers that we have? Are the numbers that are still in the works for projections for the town for their income uh, uh, with any kind of new taxing, new in income projections or, or what, or how, how, how are you calculating that part? So, so no, we, we, the town is going through the same process we are now. So I don't, <clears throat> I don't know what their projections look like at this point. Yeah. For our purposes, um, you know, it's sort of irrelevant because we need to fund our budget you know, whatever budget you guys eventually approve needs to be funded. And part of that will be the town appropriation where their projections come in is, is basically the guidance they tell us. Right. So they're going to, to work with us and say, look, revenues are going down. You know, we're not going to be able to increase 3.9 percent. So, you know, come back to us with a draft two or a draft three. That's that's lower than that, which I know is our intention to do. Uh, but at this point, I haven't heard from them what their budget is looking like for. FY22. Okay, can I, can I also? Mm -hmm. And uh, so from what I understand, we're being, and I think uh, it's been stated before that the state is shortening, uh, shorting us uh, 169,000 uh, negatively uh, for, for the state aid. And uh, our dollars from our system then going to sub supplement other systems in the state? 
Is that what they're trying to do is still to have some kind of equalizing formula? I, I don't think I would characterize it like that. Um, the way the funding formula works, um, it, it's fairly co complicated, but it really boils down to um, the formula itself boils down to whether or not the state believes each community based on its assessed value is providing enough local support. And based on the assessed value for Portsmouth, which is very high uh, and actually increased substantially versus the assessed value used in last year's formula, um, it kicks out a number that says, based on that, the number of students you have and the amount of assessed value, value you have per student, this is how much you should be providing as community and this is how much the state should be providing to support you. Uh, and those numbers are just not going in Portsmouth's direction. Okay, then. Then my other comment on that would be that's damn un-American <laughs> because the people have moved to Portsmouth to raise their children. A lot of them have saved and scrimped to buy nice properties and whatnot in their neighborhoods to live in a nice community and have saved and have kept their properties up and invested and put additions and whatnot to stay in this community. And their reward for that with their children is to be shorted on income or on the cost to go somewhere else, I guess in the state or whatever, that because we're doing such a damn good job, they're gonna take some more money away from us. So to me, I mean, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's like knocking your head against the wall with, with this when we're trying to be prudent. I'm very upset at this. I thought that we were over with this 10 year takeaway program. And now I see it's just more and more and more. And I'd like to know when the heck it's going to end. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure you'll know the answer to this, Chris, but are, since the formula is based on property assessments, property valuations, are the property valuations across the state all in sync with one another? In other words, if we did, we did our valuations last year or two years ago, has East Greenwich done their valuation more recently or, or are they further behind? You know, are we using numbers that are really apples to apples no. in terms of the valuations? And I don't think we are, but no. I don't know the answer. No, no. Uh, I'm not exactly sure um, whether or not the valuations are exactly synced. I, I mean, I, I've looked at them. They do, uh, they do make adjustments to the valuations based on recent property sales. So I think they're trying to take it to an apples to apples, looking at assessed value and what they're really selling for. Um, and then they do adjust them um, a second time for uh, median income. And obviously uh, Portsmouth um, has a very high median income um, versus an average community in the state of Rhode Island. So they are making adjustments to the, they're not just using the raw numbers, uh, but I, I can't tell you that they're, you know, a hundred percent apples to apples. And, and I, I think you told me in the finance, in the finance subcommittee meeting or, or whenever that, um, the, ourselves and Little Compton are really the only two communities that saw a, a reduction in state aid. Uh, yes, yeah, so may, they might have been like maybe Block Island or something as well, but very few uh, communities saw a reduction. So we, uh, when we had our uh, joint meeting with the state legislature, we did raise this, and I know that this has been raised with the town administrator and the the president of the town council because. This is not something we were expecting. The, the adjustments for the 10 year decline have occurred and they're finished. This is really um, at like, I think the superintendent said at the beginning, kind of an unexpected <coughs> because of this property valuation calculation and um, how it feeds into the, the funding formula. So, I mean, again, we could be looking at, to make bad news worse, we could be looking at kind of a decline going forward in years unless we sort of figure out if there's anything we can, can do about it, right? It's not like this is a one year and done thing. Well, it, it seems to me they're trying to kill our system. Well, I think in some ways you, you look at the funding formula and what are the consequences of the, the, the calculation and, you know, I don't... I mean, Barrington goes up in state aid. Uh, East Greenwich has gone up in state aid. So it's not like all the, the better off communities are 
you know, maybe taking a hit to support those who need it more, which one might be able to justify, right? It's more, um, it has, I think, to do a lot with the property values. Yeah, it's and a balance. It looks like in the formula, it's definitely a balance between property values and number of students. And right now, again, just so happens Portsmouth and Little Compton are, are the two biggest losers that we saw in those projections. I mean, the good news is, if you think back to Assistant Superintendent Viveros', Superintendent Viveros discussion about numbers, hopefully we'll be starting to see the, the numbers go up in the school system, which is going to mm -hmm. help a little bit, but that's not going to happen for a few years, too. Mr. Pearl. Um, just as a comment, in all the years I've been on the school committee, and for all the meetings that have been held at the General Assembly on this subject, there's no sympathy for changing the school aid formula. It's, re it's rejected year after year. They don't seem to have any interest whatsoever in changing, and we're as we keep saying, we're one of the losers almost every year by either dollar amount or as with this coming year, um, taking a hit that we didn't even expect. At least in the last 10 years, we kind of knew it was coming. So, yeah, yeah. And, and they did say at the state legislators uh, briefing that there probably is not gonna be anything seriously done with the funding formula this year, other than maybe uh, forming a joint study committee between the House and the Senate. So what's it dead? Well, it's not going to probably <laughs> have year. a lot of yeah. lot of movement this year, but the way you've pointed it out, I mean, I I think we we have to we have to give kudos to the to the district in a number of ways in terms of really trying to hold down expenses this year, but also I think uh, being aware that if you switch out some of those positions, the way um, finance director was explaining it and move them over to the grant that allows us to get a, a higher reimbursement from the federal government. So I think you guys have already taken a number of steps to try and um, help the budget. It's, it's just that probably like you say, 3.9 is, is not something that would fly with the town. I think we all kind of know that, right? Transportation's good news if that's not as high as we expected. All right, hopefully we get some more favorable information over the next few weeks, but I, I assume what I'm hearing is you would like us to continue to do work to bring that town appropriation ask down. Have you had this, well, I, I don't see, I mean, I think there's, I, I don't personally see the town council approving a 3.9% um, increase, but what do you all think? I agree with that. Yeah. I, I just think it's a shame that uh, the, the school, our school system is, is worked like the Dickens to try to keep our budget uh, reasonable and has gone through all sorts of uh, various activities to do that. And then again, to be hit with the, this is just, to me, just awful, terrible. But 3.9, just on our side with the, with the, uh, cap uh that's not fair on the other side somehow so i don't i don't know what the answer is but are you are you hearing uh anything about state aid or federal aid that might um provide extra monies or is that something that is too uncertain to even contemplate like you have to sort of say well we won't fill these positions or do this program unless federal dollars come through or something like that yeah, I mean, uh, we, we haven't, we, you know, there's a lot of speculation about more money coming for COVID related purposes, but we just, the, no final answers we don't know yet. Um, and, you know, typically with any federal dollars, they, there's a, you know, supplement, not supplant. So they don't like to see that you're cutting positions in anticipation. You know, those, those cut the, the extra custodians, the nursing assistants, like we were careful to go after the, you know, we, we added positions we didn't have for this year with that money. Um, this you know, was from it was the above surplus and that we had last year to cover the uh, Or even, even the, we, we did get some COVID grant money from the, from the federal government that came through the state, but. That was $20,000, wasn't it? Uh, no, there was, was, it was over half a million. Yeah, close Chris, to half I'm a sorry, million, I'm sorry, you right? weren't clear on that. What? Uh, the grant money we received for COVID was over half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's, you know, that was a one time that money's going to be gone. So again, we've, we've already anticipated those positions are not built into this budget for next year. 
And again, we don't know if some of those positions might be needed, depending right. on what happens. That's with, the big fear that with, I have right uh, now. Right. With the virus. Yeah. <coughs> and we like to, we think we're going to be like completely out of this by the fall, I but guess, we just don't know. I guess my question is, what are we not doing in this budget that, hmm. you know, we need? I mean, I, I, I applaud the district in being you know, frugal and the administrators for really holding the line, but if there's something that we're not doing that would hold the district back, or do you see next year as kind of a, a recovery? I mean, I think, you know, what I've been hearing is, is you know, we're going to have to think about learning loss and, and some of these other things. Is there, is there a big ask or a wish that you feel like, you know, I know we're at 3.9, but. Yeah. So I, I think, Again, any we're anticipating, uh, you know, we're going to have to have things in place to to remediate the learning loss. But that again is what we're hearing. The federal money will be targeted okay. for. Um, so you know, we were aware of that when we were building. Uh, we know we're going to have some some curriculum needs as as we move toward high quality curriculum. Uh, you know, and you know, math, like ELA, and science. Those are the three big areas we have to continue. But. Um, we didn't even put those in this budget because of the, so we're looking for creative ways. We'll, we'll be coming back to you in the next few months because we're gonna to have to make those purchases, but those aren't even included in here. And that high quality curriculum was part of the legislation passed two years ago now, right. one year ago by the state that you have to move to the, which is a good thing. I mean, yep. we wanna to move to high quality but curriculum. Those, but those programs have big price tags. They do have big price tags. Mm. And they didn't provide any money. For and there was no money. funding, yes. yes. And, and they do all these things at the legislative <laughs> level and they provide no money. Yeah. It is yeah. they, they, re they reduced our state aid. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, okay. But I mean, I think we have yeah. enough direction to continue. Yeah. You know, you'll see some changes in the next draft. I mean, I, I fully believe that it's important to show what it costs to run the schools. And if we, if we have to take a cut, we take a cut because otherwise you're just not you're not telling the town council the information it needs and the taxpayers the information they need. But on the other hand, like it was mentioned, I think by Mr. Radney or Mr. Shears, you know, 3.9, I don't think it would, would fly. But we're taking big cuts as yeah. it is. Yeah. It's a I mean, we're taking a hit from en uh, enrollment from Little Compton. We're taking a hit on the state aid. And um, what's the other one? Um, well, those are the two, yeah, big, those ones. Are the two big ones. Yeah, so CTE. But yeah, right. a little short. Mm -hmm. Okay, should I stop sharing and move on to the next item or? Uh, sure, we're gonna need that shared though as well, right? I, I or, okay, on my left. all right, he's ready now. So yeah, the next item, once you- Okay, um, is gonna be uh, so there's no motion or anything on this. I need a motion please on business C. Yeah, I move for discussion and action on the fiscal year 22 technology five-year equipment plan. Second. It's the Costa. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Can you all hear me? I think so. uh, can the virtual folks hear? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. So I want to thank Mr. Barris, uh, all the principals, uh, Tim Arum, Sarah Del Santo, uh, worked with us together to uh, get some information, discuss what technology needs at each school, software and hardware. So we went around to each uh, building, discussed. Um, you know, how can we support teaching and learning better? Um, so we're using that information, brought it here. We met with the district leadership team. We also met with school committee members and we came up with this plan that we're gonna present today for equipment. So we're gonna go over all the, the parts for network devices, copiers, and then some Q and A. So on the overview, sorry. So this is a five year overview of the equipment that we had to put together. And that's, you all know it's very difficult to, you know, anticipate what technology is going to be like in five years from now, but as it changes so constantly, but we'll focus more on what 2022 is going to look like for our network infrastructure, um, the lease, uh, as far as technology equipment for some replacements, uh, devices one-to-one -one we do for our kindergarten, fifth grade, and ninth grade students, and then uh, some of the copiers that need to be replaced because they're already six years old, so those need to be removed and pushed out. So on this, so this, it would be our district network equipment that we need to replace this year. We have a 
13, almost 14 year old switch of the admin building. Uh, unfortunately, anything at the administration building is not considered a school building, so E-rate will not cover that. So we have to purchase that out of pocket. And we need two of those switches to replace the, the aging switch that we have at the admin building. We also need to purchase a new storage device at the high school, middle school, and that does a lot of our backup and replications. Uh, and that is not covered as well under E-rate funding. But what is covered under E-rate funding is our, our UPS and uh, networks. So the battery backup for all our servers, storage units, um, which comes in extremely handy when there's power outage and we need to make sure that those servers go down before if, if something happens to our generator. So those are very, very important. And those are covered under E-rate. So you can see that um, we applied for E-rate this year on the category two funding. Um, so we're waiting on uh, bids to come in and then we'll award the, uh, the vendor on that part. But uh, we're looking at a $15,000 for, for replacing those UPS devices at our school district. Uh, moving on to our devices. This one is the bulk of our costs. It's, we are replacing teacher laptops at the elementary schools. We were gonna go the Chromebook route, but after COVID um, and seeing some of the issues that many districts have had with, uh, with Chromebooks uh, for teachers, it probably wasn't wise. So we veered off and went back to the Windows side just to be safe. So we're going back to Windows laptops for the teachers. Uh, for this year, those elementary teachers' laptops will be going on seven years old when we replace them. So they're very, very outdated at the elementary school. So those will be done. Our C2 Music Lab, it's heavily used. It's the keyboarding lab. They do a lot of music creation here at the high school. That lab is, is outdated and will be replaced. That will be running on almost six years old. Um, we have 50 more iPads that we need to purchase district-wide. Some of the teachers' devices that we gave them this year are uh, not able to be updated. So this will be the last lot of those iPads that can't be updated any longer. So those will be replaced with new iPads for those teachers. Uh, they'll be swapping those out. And uh, the last thing is the middle school. We need to uh, fulfill the UA classrooms with TVs. And then every room at the middle school will have a TV instead of a projecting projection systems. All the projectors have been removed from those classrooms um, because they're outdated and aged. So we replace them with 65 inch, uh, 70 inch televisions in each classroom. So that's a huge advantage for them, especially with the technology that they have in those classrooms. Uh, so uh, the other thing was the, the, the Chromebooks that we are um, purchasing outright. I know I just sent that quote over to Mr. Diero today. So we had gotten our, our pricing back from Dell. But we'll be purchasing the Chromebooks for those students uh, probably before the end of the year. Can I ask a question on the Chromebooks or would you like questions at the very end? You can ask it. Sure. So, I mean, we essentially went one-to-one -one this yep. year uh, a little bit accelerated pace than we would have done because of, of COVID. Yep. How has that impacted our budget for the Chromebooks? I mean. Well, the good thing is um, we'll, we're, we'll be receiving some back from our fourth grade students advancing to fifth grade. But what's happening is those uh, devices won't last them from fifth through eighth grade. So we need a device that has a warranty and extensions and capability to last from fifth grade through eighth grade. So that's why we have to purchase, but we're, we are gonna have additional fleets available for our second grade, third grade, and fourth grade incoming because those students won't have insurance. So we'll need those devices to have the parts. So we would have all those leftovers for parts, our eighth grade devices, which are all the same. So fourth grade, eighth grade this year, and our seniors will be returning those devices and we'll be able to use those as parts for our second, third, and fourth for uh, uh, next year. So we keep recycling our parts uh, and usage, and we need it for spares because each um, coming back, each school has at least two carts of spares for children to forget or maybe break a device, and we have to fix them. So we're probably going to pump up another cart in each each building, so they'll have more devices to hand out if necessary. I think we don't need that, but uh, yeah, I think that the, was the main reason. The main that. budget implication going forward, if you see, you another way to think of it is what we've essentially done going forward is we by accelerating is we've added an additional grade every year that we, okay. we have to refresh. So, you know, we might not have been at the point where you would see the K refresh yet. Right? We were probably just at the point where we were refreshing every year, fifth and ninth grade. 
now again we're it's completely great so, yeah correct we yeah and this year we accelerated that because of we had kindergarten to the mix and we immediately had to purchase we were lucky enough to purchase you know the 150 devices we needed for our k students last minute and that was a huge effort so uh this year we're just spearheading it into an k every year we'll get it. so okay. regardless of what happens COVID or not next year mm -hmm. we'll have the devices for the students and uh final was our copiers we have two copiers one at melville library that was has been used uh, quite a bit over the over the five or six years that they've been in service and then the library here at the high school, the color copy on the back needs to be replaced as well. Um, and those have millions of copies on them in service for a while. So it continues to the use of those. It's going to cost more money for the district versus just having them uh, take away and, and replace them with new ones. So, and that's the copy of costs from our from vendor. And that's it. Any questions? No, any additional questions? Okay. Uh, looking to school committee members. Oh, I just like to give kudos to our IT department. <laughs> They're really on top of it. And I think that with the one to one and the uh, accelerations and then your recycling and whatnot, uh, like I say, it's just a really a top notch uh, bunch of people. Appreciate that. Yeah. We do, we do try to save everything we can and and scrimp as much as possible and then it also comes in handy when you know people like the town or even not just the town but the students uh this year we had to help out some cte students so parents are very very thankful that we had some windows devices or older macbooks that we had that weren't you know quote unquote functional too 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 much in the classroom but they were good enough to maybe do some work we were able to hand those out to students to use this year which was, you know, a feat with Mr. Basketball or Dr. Basketball, sorry, and uh, Mr. Riley as well, and uh, Ms. Escobar. So she was instrumental in that and getting students in the CTE program to do their work because they're at home, so they don't may not have devices. So that was a big help and for families in need. We're still helping out with, you know, hotspots and stuff. So I do appreciate that. So all the all the students have had internet access, and I, I mean, even though it might be irregular with irregular, talks, et cetera, yeah. but that's not <laughs> yeah, our problem. Well, the, <laughs> critical that's need, talks. yes, we have hotspots still available out in the wild, and you know yeah. that's been happening. Uh, but for the most part, Cox has been good and helping as much as possible. Verizon's been great too with personal devices as well. So we've been dealing with a lot of those vendors and helping out families as, as well. So very good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we do need to vote on this tonight. Let me just see, um, just seeing if Ms. McDay, I'm going to make sure any, no, no you questions. questions. No okay. Questions. No more questions. Um, uh, let me uh, call the vote then uh, for approving the FY22 technology five year equipment plan. Ms. McDade? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Badney? Aye. Uh, Mr. Payero? Aye. And Emily Copeland? Aye. Uh, unanimous 7 0. Thank you very much, Thank uh, you. Mr. Costa, and your whole team. So. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate um, it. Uh, uh, business item C, these are, these next few things are policy. Um, so Ms. McDade, do you want to take the lead on that? Sure. Um, I move for discussion and action of the administering, administering medicines to students policy, which is JLCD. Second. Okay. Uh, no changes since the last read, correct? Not since the last time. That's correct. So this is our second read of this one. And we do not need a vote, right? Correct. correct. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, wait, I, I, do we, is this, we do vote I, this time. I thought the, yeah, I think uh, C and D are right. I was just going to point out, I think it's a little, so it's the second read of the committee, but technically the third read, because we consider the subcommittee the first read. So, so yeah, this is. So we need a vote. For C, okay. C and D, you are voting to approve if you. All right. Or not. And I see no questions from the committee. So calling the vote, Ms. McDade? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Badney? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Emily Copeland? Aye. Unanimous 7 0. Uh, e, please, Ms. McDade. Um, I move for discussion and action of the non discrimination policy AC. Second. 
and any, any changes? Not significant changes since our last meeting. Just editing. This is, it's the same. This is in the same, uh, yeah. the same position. So this is our our second read as a full committee, and our final read. All right. Looking for questions, comments. Seeing none. Calling the vote, Ms. McDade. Aye. Ms. Kelly. Aye. Uh, Mr. Ferber. Aye. Mr. Shears. Aye. Mr. Vadney. Aye. Mr. Payero. Aye. Ms. Copeland. Aye. Uh, unanimous seven zero. Business item E, please. Um, is it possible for us to take E, F, and G as a group, or do we need to take them separately? Do you think? I'll take them as a group. Okay. So we had some policies. Uh, well, oh, I, I'll move for discussion and action of removal of policy 5600, uh, removal of policy 4350 and 4354, and removal of policy 5132. Second. Would you explain? Sure. Um, uh, Mr. Kenworthy and um, Ms. Aguirre went through, were going through the policies and discovered uh, a few policies which were replaced by new revised policies relatively recently. Um, you'll find those in the backup. And so what we're doing now is uh, essentially retiring the old policies that have already been replaced. And this was all recommended by the subcommittee and Dr. Kenworthy. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. Any questions? Seeing no questions, calling the vote, Ms. McDade? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Emily Copeland? Aye. Unanimous 7 0. Uh, moving on to financial reports, Mr. Diero. That was faster than you expected. <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to pull it up or not, but there's not much to um, report on. We're, this is the January um, financials. We're on budget. We look like we may be trending towards uh, you know, a COVID-19 related surplus. Too early to put a number on that, but I'll continue to uh, report out each month on that. Okay, I'll be happy to pull it up if we have any questions. I looked at it and didn't have any, any questions. Seeing no questions, thank you very much. We just received these. We don't need to report on them. Um, our next meeting is March 9th, followed by March 23rd. Any other announcements? I can think of that we already haven't already mentioned. Okay. I uh, can have a motion to call for adjournment, please. So moved. Second. Uh, calling the vote, Ms. McDade. Aye. Ms. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ferber. Aye. Mr. Sheehan. Aye. Mr. Vadney. Aye. Mr. Piero. Aye. Emily Copeland. Aye. Unanimous. 7-0. Thank you all very much for joining us Thank you. Uh, tonight. And uh, wish you all a pleasant evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good, night. Good, night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Yeah, I was just saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now oh, see, are we ending the meeting? Yeah, it's done. It's still on the screen. <laughs>